I came to the United States when I was 10. So, um, of course, by the age of 10, wherever you grow up, you retain a certain amount of your own cultural experience and background. So in my case, uh, I came to the United States when I was 10, and um, I lived with my uncle and aunt, who were very much uh, influenced and had been already living in the, in the Western culture. So my growing up experiences in terms of music was, uh, you know, Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and, uh, you know, I had already had a good amount of dose of uh, Indian and Pakistani uh, classical music. Um, so it was more like a fusion, you know, I already had a certain sound in my head by the time I came here and then my training, both in, uh, you know, early training and also at the university level was mainly Western classical music. So for many years, uh, I did not have exposure, you know, until I was uh, late into my 20s, uh, where I started to recognize that there was something uh, else that I needed to include, and uh, that was, you know, music from my own background.
first piece that you heard was more in the tradition of uh, Indian Pakistani Hindustani classical music and uh, that was very much like a uh, evolvement of life itself you know where the piece starts with just introducing one note from the raga and then uh, that idea develops you know just like an embryo who's just being born and is developing into a human being um, and it slowly grows the idea grows and in that growth period it's uh, getting more sophisticated uh, it's uh, developing momentum uh, it's developing a personality and you start to almost like you know it's like a Michelangelo sculpture where you start with a stone and you slowly carve and uh, after some months or some years the actual image starts to appear so for me that's that's what it's like even when I sit down you know for writing compositions is I always have that in the back of my mind and it takes it takes time to develop the ideas the very first part of that raga um, is improvised because that's a tradition both in Indian and Hindustani classical music and also in flamenco um, where certain ideas and you have a structure there's a very uh, form and structure is there but there are certain things which are intuitive and uh, uh, but that's from both from internal experience and also from training but it has to do with something very deep and passionate inside that has to uh, start developing o over a period of time and also the important fact of being there in the moment of what you're feeling. The only piece which was uh, had a little bit of improvisation in it was the very first one and then even that one only had the improvisation in the slow introduction where I was developing one note at a time of the raga. Um, everything else um, is written down, you know, or published. It's something that has a, already has a definite structure. So none of the other pieces were improvised. Um, but, you know, my note about improvisation, which is important to understand, is that if, if you are improvising uh, and it sounds like it's being improvised, then you have not succeeded. Um, Improvisation only works when there is a certain uh, structure to it, as intuitive it may be. Uh, you should be able to decipher melody and a direction. Um, for which reason, a lot of the very, very experimental music, you know, from uh, let's say the 50s and the 60s, in the mainstream classical genre, I've never been a fan of because to me. Um, it's almost like uh, what some of the artists the back then were trying to create, both with painting and, you know, where somebody takes uh, some box of paint and they throw it on the canvas and it makes these interesting lines or figures and they say, this is art or, you know, people sitting down and throwing dice and then taking those numbers and transferring them to uh, musical notes. Uh, maybe I don't understand it, but it, it's, it's, I've, I've never been attracted to that sort of improvisation. So for me, you know, improvisation is, uh, I'm sure that, you know, Bach in his time used to improvise preludes um, and uh, even used to improvise fugues. But if those same fugues are the ones that we are witnessing today, they have an enormous amount of uh, structure to them. And that is only gotten from uh, understanding and uh, training and uh, getting the right kind of uh, information. You know, as far as technique, technique is, uh, and I you know, tell this to my students, that we never learn technique to learn technique or to play fast. We learn technique to play beautiful music. Uh, that is the final arrival point of technique. And, um, um, so if I'm playing something impressive or I'm playing fast, um, it should not, the attention should not be drawn to the, how fast I'm playing it or how accurately precise I'm playing it. The attention should be drawn to the, what's being created, you know, the music, the pathway that's being designed. like to say a couple of words. Uh, it's the second year I'm here 
And uh, how many people here speak English? Yeah, everybody? And uh, I should tell you how I met Levy originally. Levy was in New York a few years ago, and uh, he was having an argument with one of the police officers. <laughs> and uh, I came there to help him. Um, there was a sign that he parked his car. You know, New York, the laws are very strict. There was a sign that says, tow zone. That means they will take your car away. Tow zone, no parking anytime. You cannot park anytime. So the, um, the police officer was from India. So he had this very heavy accent. He talked like this all the time. So Livio said, you know, uh, I don't know what the problem is, but you know, the sign, the police officer says, yeah, the sign, you know, it says tow zone. We take your car away. Tow zone, no parking anytime, but you park here. I just give you a ticket. You are lucky I will not take the car away. And Livio said, well, you know, I'm from Romania. It depends how you read it. You read it, tow zone, no parking anytime. I read it, tow zone, no, parking anytime.
this uh, next piece um, is a homage to Barrios that I wrote a few years ago um, as a study in uh, playing uh, more than four voices at one time because I have developed this condition called focal dystonia. So this was writ written as an etude for a student and uh, who had the same, same problem with the right hand. And um, so in the second part of this, which is called the finger walk, and this piece will be available with Mel Bay uh, after September, if you are interested, um, is written for that very specific purpose of uh, uh, trying to adjust the problems that you know, one develops with the right hand and still be able to maintain some sort of technique. <clears throat>
play the g genres that I play because I want to make money. I play because I like it. It just so happens that as a byproduct, it's successful. Um, and I'm, I think I'm lucky in that regard because uh, um, I have a voice. When people see my name, they associate a certain kind of style and music. Uh, but for the hundreds of classical guitarists who are playing Bach, um, I don't know. I mean, it's very tough to say that this one person is perfect or this one, you know. So what happens to all the others? They get lost in the mix, you know, somewhere. At some point, you have to be practical about certain things. You know, if I teach at the university, um, the same thing, you know, if I'm teaching theory or I'm teaching composition, if I'm teaching, uh, uh, you know, 18th century counterpoint or something like that, it, it cannot be ins influenced by flamenco because there's no such thing. You know, you have to stay pure in, in certain things. So there, it, it takes a little bit of uh, adjustment when I'm, um, that's why uh, this season I only decided to do this program. Uh, there are no classical pieces this season. Next season, I'm probably going to play some Bach. Uh, but I cannot juxtapose it with um, any of the pieces I'm doing today because it requires very different technique. You know, for flamenco, I'm always, uh, you're doing a lot of these rusgiados, and it, uh, it has an effect on your nails. And then you go to classical, which is a very fine, uh, like silk, kind of tone you need for that, but then you don't have the nails because you've been playing flamenco. Um, and that adjustment can be uh, very tiring and uh, very challenging because it's not just the technique and the sound, you also have to mentally adjust yourself, you know, going from, uh, it's, it's really almost a uh, change of a language. Uh, uh, yes, I know people say that music is a universal language, but uh, there are many dialects within, within the genre of music. Um, and people may appreciate it and they may understand it, they may enjoy it, but the person who's performing it has to make that switch, you know, has to make that adjustment. And uh, so right now it's impossible for me to pick up a guitar and uh, as, at least for concert purposes to start playing Bach because my mind is not there, you know. Next season if I start playing Bach, then I will probably not play some of the pieces that I played last night uh, and do more, more of a traditional, uh, but there's not too many people who can uh, do both uh, the traditional and the uh, other genres convincingly in, you know, in one program. If I go and I play sitar uh, guitar, which I played last night, um, People know that my training is classical classical guitarist, and they listen to the music and they say, "Oh, this is something new. This is something fresh." And uh, but you also play Bach, yeah, sure. You know, next year I will play Bach, and so it will. It, it creates a it creates a curiosity. It creates an interest, and I think it's through that curiosity and an interest that I consider myself an ambassador of classical guitar. I need some music. You know, in terms of this duo, first of all, um, this is a different piece that, than that's listed. Um, and uh, Stanley I and I are not a classical guitar duo. Matter of fact, we've never played together before. And the main reason for that is because I really don't like him very much. 